here we are, we're gonna talk about dark matter. Uh, <laughs> let me introduce my guests. Elena Aprile is an experimental particle physicist, uh, professor at Columbia University. Elena is also the founder and spokesperson for the Xenon Dark Matter Experiment, and we'll be talking about that. Let's welcome Elena. Uh, Peter Fisher is a professor of physics at MIT, and currently you're the head of the department, is that right? Um, head of the physics department at MIT. I'm an alum from MIT, so we talked about that. You weren't head of the department back then. <laughs> Are you wearing your cufflinks, your infinity cufflinks? Oh, they're eights. <laughs> Why eight? You need to use your mic. Course eight. Oh, oh course eight. Wait, course eight is physics? Can you believe I can't remember? Building six. I was in building yeah, six. Okay. All the courses are numbered and all the buildings are numbered, yeah. Um, okay, little private conversation there. You were doing uh, what? I was in building six in theoretical physics. Ah, yeah, okay. not 37 for astrophysics. Um, Peter works on experimental approaches to dark matter and also very interestingly innovative ideas on wireless power transfer, which I'm looking forward to. And I saw in your bio you also added bonsai. So I don't know if that's real. <laughs> <laughs> I have real? one small plan. <laughs> okay, that's and enough. I keep it small. Um, okay, so <laughs> here we go. We're launching into one of the uh, most um, confusing mysteries in cosmology today. And I, I love that we have mysteries still. Dark matter is one of those examples where by studying the universe, we got so good at understanding it, we realized how much we didn't know. A lot of times when people hear that we don't know what most of the universe uh, is composed of, they think it's a sign of ignorance, but it's actually because we hedged in so, we, we learned so much in precision about our universe that we were able to discover um, things we can't even see. And so let's talk about things we can see first. So what can we see? When you know Galileo first looks through the telescope, he sees things like Saturn. Um, these are things we can see. We can see things like the Crab Nebula, um, which is in our own galaxy and is the um, byproduct probably of a supernova explosion and a collapse of a star. We can see things like entire galaxies, like the Milky Way. So our galaxy has 100 billion stars and um, maybe a few hundred billion stars, and we see that there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. Peter, I know you wanted to um, look at the Hubble Deep Field. This is not the Hubble Deep Field. This is another galaxy uh, with a companion, but this is, oh, sorry, I forgot about this one. Edge on Galaxy, Sombrero Galaxy. We see this incredible variety of luminous objects in the cosmos. This image from Hubble, do you wanna tell us about this? Well, so uh, this is the Hubble uh, Deep Field, mm -hmm. and it, it's, to me, one of the most incredible pictures ever taken with a telescope probably the most incredible picture taken with the telescope because what was done was the Hubble Space Telescope was pointed at the darkest part of the sky and left collecting light for I think ultimately 10 million seconds. To give you some idea of how much time that is, uh, astronomy colleagues in my department will scratch each other's eyes out for 5,000 seconds. So that's a lot of time. And so everything you see here is a galaxy. And you can see they have all kinds of different shapes. That one's kind of a blob. There's a nice spiral there. Some are red, some are green, some are blue. There, there, here's a little red one. That one looks kind of like the Milky Way. And, and so there, there's this vast panoply of different morphologies, or they look different, all because of dark matter. And this is the darkest part of the sky, and this is a tiny fraction. This is way less than a square degree. You know, it's, it's about the size of the head of a pin held here on the sky. But what's really mind-blowing is if you just go and you look right there, that, that's like one pixel barely above, barely visible. That's a galaxy with 100 billion stars on the other side of the universe. And, and we know it since 1920 or something yeah. because of Hubble, no? Yeah, Edwin Hubble. I mean, that's to this why this telescope. Yeah. 
So that's why this is, you, you can download it, type, uh, just go to Google and type XDF <laughs> and, and you can get, it's a good screensaver. Well, I, Elena, your, your, <laughs> your point um, about Hubble is that even when Einstein was working on his theory of curved space-time, he did not know there were other galaxies. Yeah. I and mean, I think that's just a remarkable fact. I mean, and it's not too long ago. I mean, we thought that we were the only one, right? The Milky Way was the would, only galaxy. Would, unique, would be unique, but this is what Hubble told us in 1924, I think, that the universe is filled with galaxies like our Milky Way. And all of them, even all these Billions of galaxies make nothing, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, constitute nothing of the total of the universe. Right, so is this is the interesting point to come to. We look at all the planets, we look at all the stuff on the Earth, we go beyond the planets and the Earth, and we look at all the stuff in our own galaxy, things like the Crab Nebula and other stars, hundreds of billions of stars, and we look at all the galaxies. With the Hubble Deep Field, the estimation is that there are as many galaxies in the sky as there are stars in our own galaxy. And all of that, everything we have ever seen, which has been brought to us from light predominantly, very predominantly, all of that makes up a tiny fraction of what's out there. So do you want to tell us what fraction, Elena? <laughs> well, I mean, so we know that it makes all this stuff that we know of, which is coming to us through the visible, because we can observe it, it's only maybe 15%, I mean, it's a tiny fraction of the total mass of the universe. So we don't know 85% of, of the, the mass. total mass in this universe, and which we, is a big thing. If we thought of it just in terms of energy composition, it's less that than 5%. 20, that's less than 5% of the total energy density of the universe, yeah. So well, it, it looks like we are very insignificant, but we're not. Yeah, so... There's this we're sort of small, but we're very well organized. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to talk about um, how it is that everything we see in the universe is less than 5% of the contents of the universe. And um, as there were a bit of ashy residue left over from the Big Bang, right? So I, I um, referenced this um, primordial soup. Do you know Rocky Kolb? You must know Rocky. So Rocky is a famous cosmologist from University of Chicago, and he makes these soup cans called primordial soup. And the directions are to heat ingredients to 3,000 billion trillion degrees, um, stirring occasionally if you wish. Um, if allowed to cool for 14 billion years, this product will become the atoms that make up our observable universe. <laughs> and the ingredients are mostly quarks, force carriers, the Higgs. And now we know, actually, when Rocky made this can of soup, it he was, didn't know about it. He didn't know. Yeah. So it's very recent. So, so now we realize, and how do we realize that most of the universe is made up of dark matter? I was going to start with Zwicky. Hmm. Do you remember Zwicky? <laughs> Zwicky looked at the coma cluster. This is a picture of a cluster of galaxies. So it's not just one galaxy, but it's an entire cluster of galaxies. And uh, he estimated that some very large fraction of it was not visible um, by looking at the motions of the galaxies in the cluster. This is actually a beautiful detail in the coma cluster. It's um, a beautiful spiral galaxy deep in the coma cluster, which is probably pretty similar to our own galaxy. Now, Zwicky was considered kind of nutty, don't you think? Uh, yeah. Do you remember history of Zwicky? Bits and pieces. I was a, a PhD student. Uh, actually, our labs were near where Zwicky's was, and my, my advisor was a Swiss like, like Zwicky, and and a very formal man, and I, I asked him if Zwicky was still around. I knew he was retired, and Felix, my advisor, said, oh, no, he's dead, thank God. And, uh, was he, it Felix Bohm? Felix Bohm, yeah. And uh, uh, Zwicky wasn't a nice man, I, I, I think, uh, and uh, that, that might have delayed progress. On, this was on 1930s. 1930s. This is 33 was when he started, and, and there were several papers. I think the latest was, was 37. And he actually coins the term dark matter. Dunkel matter. Yeah, so that, dunkel matter. The, the term dark matter is very interesting because he uses it in his paper, but um, then it falls out of use. And it is essentially unused until 1983 when a particle physicist uses it 
in a paper, Joel Premack. Um, and, and so in that interval, dark matter was not considered really a particle physics problem. It was more an astronomy, astronomy. problem. It was referred to as missing mass. You worked on missing mass, or some. And, yeah, so uh, were you, I mean, do you think that before this time people were concerned about Zwicky's observation that there seemed to be some kind of matter that was making galaxies move around but could yeah. not be luminous? I don't think so, I don't know. People but just weren't concerned. No, of course, I mean. Well, the, we, this is so, we, we I were, mean. I mean, galaxies were 1924, and, and so that was, that was, I mean, we barely knew about atoms, right? I mean, I'm not an astronomer, but I know I was not concerned when I was studying physics in my graduate student years. I mean, I so don't So I think can imagine that that was just not the concern for the community, I guess you said that it was an astronomy problem, right? Well, let's look at it from the point of view of the astronomers. They're looking out at the universe and they're saying, okay, so some of the ma mass is dark, but big deal. I mean, who cares? I mean, the earth in principle is dark. It's the sun that illuminates it. Yeah, well, and so there could be a lot of dark stuff. Astronomers are like that. What was that? The astronomers, astronomers are, are like that. that. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, I, I've learned the hard way that, that it, it, it f, f, well, at MIT, uh, we don't have a separate astronomy department. We mm. have, our astronomers are part of the physics department. They don't like it. They don't like being called physics. The same, yeah, Columbia. Yeah, oh yeah, okay, so you're <laughs> familiar. And, and you know, if you, if you call them a physicist, they'll rabbit punch you in the eye. And um, so their thing you is- You scratch each other's eyes out, you rabbit, that is actually it's, kind it's, of my memory of MIT, actually, yeah. it's pretty accurate. It's nice, it's, it's better now, yeah. ex except- I've heard rumor. Um, well, but, but uh, so my, my, my colleague, Paul Schechter, uh, who's an astronomer, said the difference between he and me is uh, he looks at a galaxy and asks, what can physics tell me about that galaxy? I look at a galaxy and ask, what can that galaxy tell me about physics? Mm -hmm. So their, their concerns are different. I mean, they have a different union card. Right. <laughs> so, so they so, just aren't worried. So, so far, I think what we've said doesn't sound that alarming, but in other words, so what if there's matter that's not luminous, astronomers would be okay with that, but then particle physicists come along and start to become concerned. But before we talk about that, let's look at, um, this is a computer simulation um, from Stanford of large scale structure, which means that we're looking at enormous clusters of galaxies, not just the formation of galaxies, but formation of huge clusters of galaxies, which we observe um, to lie on these enormous webs of filamentary structure. Um, and we, we believe that most galaxies go through multiple collisions over the course of their lifetime. Now, the argument even um, in astronomy is that those st huge structures can't form uh, if we only look at the luminous matter, there hasn't been enough time essentially since the Big Bang for such enormous structures to form. And that for them to form, there must be some dark matter that we can't see to catalyze uh, the collapse of material into these huge structures. Um, but still, that's not so bad, but there's lots of this evidence for dark matter. Um, sorry, I was missing that one. The, the spooky thing is that, uh, uh, Peter, maybe you want to talk about this aspect, about the amount of dark matter compared to visible matter, um, that that's surprising. How this assessment of 80%, do you think that that turned out to be a, a surprising number? Or did you think it would go away? Well, it, this, this, this started coming up about when I was in the field and one of the, mm -hmm. one of the arguments was, and this is, this is the way theoretical physicists think, is that there was a, there was a number which was the, um, the, the fraction of uh, critical density uh, measured in the universe. So there's a magic critical density that keeps the universe from expanding uh, and uh, that's one. And if at the time everybody did uh, a census of all the matter in the universe using telescopes and everything, it'd get 0.1, so one tenth. So theorists would assume, well. You don't mean it keeps the universe expanding, hmm? you mean it keeps it flat? Keeps it flat, yes. That's Thank okay. You. That's so the universe is definitely yeah. expanding, as Hubble right. saw. Right. But the question was whether or not 
spatially it was literally flat, flat. things yeah. traveled in straight lines, straight lines or if things yeah. traveled on curves as they if the light right. from other galaxies traveled on curves yeah. um, but th the logic was well this number is close to one point one is close to one in certain ways and things therefore it's probably one and something's missing and and you know sort of wishful thinking and uh, I, I remember in probably 84 85 hearing this in some seminar thinking and, and thinking like, wow, that's just like really bad logic. Turned out to be right. Um, shows you how much I know. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason why, so this was one of the things which astronomers really didn't care about. They're like, who cares if the universe is flat or slightly curved, it doesn't matter to us. If you look at the origin of the universe, it would evolve away from flatness extremely, extremely quickly. Yeah. So in order for the universe to have, to be slightly curved today, 14 billion years into its history, it would have to be perfectly flat, except for slightly curved by like one part in a trillion, trillion, trillion. And that number made theoretical Four physicists, trillion. Four trillions? Thank you. Trillion, 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 trillion. Um, that made theoretical physicists suspect that the only stable value is if the universe is exactly flat, right? So, so that started to be an argument that maybe there's something missing if, if the only luminous stuff in the universe makes up for much less than that. Um, I wanted to show this about this, I just found this graphic, I think it's a NASA graphic, but I'm sorry, it might be the uh, European Southern Observatory, where they're showing how um, we can discover that there's matter out there that we can't see. I mean, how could we possibly know that there's matter out there that we can't see? One way is by looking at the effects of matter on light. I'm going to start that over again. I, I don't know, Peter, you, you want to do this one? You, you, you've never seen it before. <laughs> Elena, you want to try it? Yeah, that's fine. Go for it. <laughs> to, me, to me, this phenomenal, phenomenon of gravitational lensing, as we say, is the only way visually that we can bring to you or to us uh, when we say there is there must be dark matter there so that's this gravitational lensing which of course uh, i'll just keep replaying it <laughs> while you talk about so, it uh, einstein predicted uh, long ago i mean it was it was it was uh, expected that the mass i mean the presence of a mass bends light and so that's essentially this phenomenon. If you're looking from Earth at this, play, at, this, at this galaxy out there, and in the middle there is this big blob that she's showing, which is probably a cluster of galaxy. So there's a big mass full of dark matter, as we know now. So the, the, the image of that object that we are observing, in that case the, cluster, the, the galaxy there, will be distorted because the light from that object will be bent by the presence of that mass. So mass bends light, which is what uh, is predicted, but usually, so if you think of light rays coming from that object, you would expect to come straight to your eyes if you are on Earth or your telescope, but those rays of light are bent by the presence of mass, and so you will see a distorted or multiple image of that thing. And since you're not really aligned, your eyes or telescope are not really aligned with that object, you actually get a, a whole, let's say, cone of images, and the projection of that cone is going to be a circle, the so-called Einstein circle. And because we're not aligned, actually, the circle is split in little pieces. So if you have this little distortion that you see here are the Einstein, I mean, are the images, split images of that of that galaxy that we are observing because of the presence of mass, of gravitational uh, mass, the dark matter in between us and the object. Yeah, so we see these broken um, You see these arcs of arcs. circle. And that's really the distant galaxy that we're looking at smeared out on the sky, which is telling us there must be some big mass between us and that distant galaxy. So even if you can't see that big mass, you deduce it's there by seeing this funny lens, just as if you if you looked at an object in this room through a completely transparent lens, you would understand it was there by how it distorted the images behind it, and that's yeah, exactly a, the phenomenon. Yeah, it's a crappy lens, though. 
It's a crummy lens. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> How do you mean? It smears things. It's, yes. it's, it doesn't focus. You know, we're used to good it's lenses. It's not a good like pair of glasses. But, that, but <laughs> that's why we do all these beautiful reconstructions of yeah. mass because from from the images that we get, let's say from these telescopes, we can actually reconstruct uh, the mass, the total mass, which is between our self or the telescope and the object we are observing. And when we do this reconstruction, which is a very complicated process, we can infer actually very precisely the same thing that we can infer and mm -hmm. others. So there must be a lot of mass to explain this, this observation. So um, even then, it's not that surprising. You could imagine that there's some masses out there that just didn't ignite like a star and just aren't luminous. So I think the really interesting conversation um, begins when we start to see that the dark matter does not interact with light at all. Okay, so can we talk about that, Elena? This is, uh, of course, one of your areas of expertise too. This, this material is fundamentally different than everything else we've ever seen in the universe. It is absolutely not made of the same stuff that we're made of. And how do we know but, that? But we know quite a few things about it though, so we have come to have a good identikit, how do you say that? So how do we know that it's there? Well, one observation is the one we just showed you, this gravitational lensing, which is observed over and over, is a very clear demonstration there must be something there to bend this, this light that we see from these objects, right? We mentioned this Swiki, we didn't say why. Actually, one of the big questions I still have today, why did he start to look at that? Why format? did he look at it? I yeah. don't he, know. he wanted to measure the mass. He wanted okay, to measure so, the mass. Okay, so we didn't tell him why did he want to measure the mass by looking at coma, actually. <laughs> well, he, you <laughs> The can same tell way that we yeah. can measure the mass of the sun by measuring the rotation of our Earth around the sun, right? So, but why did he start with coma? That's a question for her or for you. I, I don't know why you I started no with idea. coma. I just think it was a good visible cluster and yeah, he could measure the velocities. It was, it was high in the sky. Yeah. And, so uh, you know, because it's, it's about straight up. It's, it's like about North the size Pole. Of, yeah, it's about the size yeah. of your thumb. Okay. Okay, you can actually so. see coma if we, di if we didn't have foggy night and if we didn't have Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> shining lights on us. We could probably see coma very comfortably okay, with so our telescopes in the garden. Okay, so was looking at coma for whatever reason he had. <laughs> Then gravitational lensing, and of course we didn't, I don't think we have a slide on these rotation curves that I don't Vela Rubin, and so we have had a lot of work go, starting yeah, in this. the 70s. Let's talk about Vera you, Rubin, so yeah, we can do this one. you talk about that spiral galaxy there. That's I our, skipped this because this, yeah. this is an artist's rendition, not a real picture. And the but this is the way we see yeah. physicists, we see the, yeah. the galaxies, right? It's with this right. right. central bulge and all the nice spiral arms, the visible stuff. But then for me, what the galaxy is, like our Milky Way where we are, is this blue halo, this huge halo. We, I don't know why we paint it blue, but whatever. We painted it blue, yeah. This is exactly But this is the, the halo of dark matter which mm -hmm. surrounds every galaxy, which, which, okay, so. So Vela Rubin, other than Swiki, gravitational lensing, and many other stories, but I think the study of rotation curves of these stars, which are in every galaxy, and the painstakingly precise study of these rotation curves is another great so evidence that we So the rotation curves give. tell you that, so let's say you move further and further from the sun. Yes. You would expect the planets to be moving slower and slower because the, the effect of the sun is just dropping off as you move away. And so you would expect the same thing for the galaxy. You move further and further from the center of the galaxy, you would expect that stars on the outer reaches would be moving more slowly. But instead, what you're calling yeah, rotation curves is they're, they're booking, they're just cruising. Yeah. <laughs> right, and so right. there's a lot of mass still pulling on them. And none of that mass is luminous, none of that mass is visible. And so that's what we're mapping out in this sort of blue, blue So that's the first paint. evidence we give, or the most direct mm -hmm. evidence we give. The rotation curves of every galaxy over and over turns out to show that the speed at which the stars in these galaxies move is actually not decreasing with one over r squared, where r is the distance from the center of the galaxy, but rather stays more or less constant as far out as you can measure with telescopes on Earth, of course. So to explain this strange behavior of flat rotation curves, 
you need to invoke that there must be something else in this galaxy which gives, provides the gravitational pull for the stars out there to keep moving around the center. And that's, again, if you calculate how much mass must be there, you get, again, about a factor of five, ten more than the visible stuff that you measure and the visible light from all the stars that you see, right? Yeah. So that's one of so the evidence of dark matter from rotation curves of galaxies, so of stars in galaxies like ours. People thought um, for a while that they were objects called massive astrophysical compact halo objects, which were that called machos. The machos. There's a lot of <laughs> astrophysics terminology that references male insecurity about masculinity. <laughs> Um, machos, there were Rambos. What were Rambos again? No, I don't I know what Rambos are And then a Rocky Cole, the same person, came up with nachos, which nachos. were not astrophysical compact halo objects. Um, but, um, but that's fallen out of favor. So I wanted to, maybe, Peter, you could talk to us about the, the, what we, the conventional, or actually, maybe I'm going to make you do the unconventional version of dark matter. Elena, maybe you should talk about what the conventional particle physics idea is of what these what dark matter oh, might be. Oh, the other male insecurity, you mean? The wimp? The wimp. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be a woman, actually. I be. So we have this... Okay. So we know a lot about dark matter, actually, since, since it first was brought up to us, so all this observation, we talked about it. So essentially what we know about, the first thing most important we know about is this precise measurement of its abundance in this universe. And that comes from the latest and the most precise measurements with observation of this uh, cosmic microwave background, which is this leftover radiation from the Big Bang, right? We haven't talked about it, but we know exactly how much dark matter must be in the universe from precise cosmological measurements, correct? So that's the most important things we know, but we also know that it must be actually neutral. It doesn't have any electric charge because otherwise it would interact electromagnetically and we haven't seen it, right? So it must be well, neutral as I have said. to translate that. Do you mind if I oh, translate that? That was Italian for... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was I didn't Italian think so. For I said <laughs> it has no electric charge, but everybody knows that we no, are... No, it's amazing. My mother doesn't know what electric charge is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it, it doesn't carry anything which... Okay, interacts so with light. We interact I would just with say light. That. Okay. Yeah. So the dark matter is dark precisely because it doesn't interact with light. I mean, that is a strange thing, though. Everything we know. I mean, if you think about everything we know in the universe. Well, everything and on this we Earth, know is electromagnetic. I mean, everything we feel, the most yeah. common things that we experience, is based on the electromagnetic force and the fact that charge things are charged. I'm charged. You're charged. So we interact, right? So we we feel this interaction, which is the electromagnetic force, and that's the most actually visible, how do you say, the one that we experience in everyday life, isn't it? So, yeah. sorry. No, no. So I, I thought the yeah. charge, the fact that we are charged particles, it's yeah. a well-known so, fact. Is, I mean, when we talk about dark matter, we're talking about a kind of material that absolutely will not interact with light. Okay. I mean, right now, presumably, how many dark matter particles do you think are passing through us right now. I mean, if they're particles, I know you don't think that they are, so we'll come well, to that no, in a second. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, <laughs> I, I, I'm exploring other options. There, there, no, there's about, there's about one per quart. What? So about one per quart. Per quart? Yeah, yeah but Liter. what is that? Ah. Liter. What are these Wait. units? <laughs> yeah, what are these units per what time? So, like, I always heard, maybe this isn't right. Can you, you tell see, me if this is right? We should use the metric system, please, please. I'm going to use, I'm going to use my, <laughs> I'm going to use my thumbnail uh, lost me as a unit. Yeah. Okay. Like, I so always thought, your thumb yeah, or whatever, right? a, a million per second through my thumbnail. Oh, maybe a, even a, you can say a billion through every one of us, about 70 kilos something. So right 50, now, 70 10, 10 kilos million. mass. Right now, if dark matter is indeed uh, what you called a wimp, which is a particle that does not interact with light, a billion of them would be passing through every one of us every second. In and how do we know that? I guess we, we forget to say that we know it from this famous density of dark matter that we infer from the measurements of the accounting of the universe with CMB, with this Planck 
satellites, which is this beautiful thing out there. But anyway, we know that we as we know the density of dark matter in the halo of this Milky Way to which we belong. And from that, I guess if we assume a mass, which she didn't say yet, Janna. Yeah, I didn't. If we <laughs> assume that it's kind of heavy, like 100 times the mass of a proton maybe, mm -hmm. we assume a mass for this particle, and then you can calculate more or less how many of them hit every they go square about a centimeter thousand, a thousand every to second. The speed of light, so. and, they, and they move. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> and they move with the speed with which the stars are moving in this galaxy, which is what this Vela Rubin and others measure, right? But yeah. 200 kilometers so per second. So our own our own solar system is uh, going at about 200 kilometers per second around the center. So of we the can Milky calculate Way. how many mm -hmm. hit every square centimeter, mm -hmm. any unit mm -hmm. area, as we say, mm -hmm. every unit of time, every second. So, Peter, you started, I mean, you're an experimentalist, mm -hmm. and you've built, you've worked on I did one dark of the, matter experiments. I did one of the first searches for dark matter. And it what kind a of a particle experience. were you looking for? It was a <laughs> what? bad experience. Bad Tell me why it was a bad experience. Which one was that? Sorry, if it, it didn't have a name. It <laughs> That's why. It was such a bad experiment, experiment, it didn't even earn an no, acronym. No, it wasn't even supposed to look for... It should have been it, called BAD. Mm. How could we make an acronym out of that? <laughs> Boston, I was, astrophysical. Uh, I was at Caltech then, and, but I was living in Switzerland. And uh, my, my, my thesis, I wrote, I, I did a thesis experiment um, on eight diodes. Um, for the electrical engineers in the audience all know that a diode is the simplest electronic thing. So I, I, I like simple things. And I was actually looking for a f process called neutrinoless double beta decay, which mm. I see. People are still looking for it. It's one of the colossal failures uh, ah. of, of physics that we haven't found <laughs> it yet. But I, I went to a conference, and uh, this guy named David Spurgel mm. started talking about, uh, he's a theorist. And uh, theorists are, are, are amazing people because, you know, if you're well, a she's one. Yeah, I know. Yeah, watch I, it. Careful. I, I, I wrote my first paper, scientific publication, with David Spurgel. I'm going to say something yeah. good. Okay, right. sorry to interrupt. So, don't something good, me. something good. I can't uh, be quiet for. So it's not enough just to develop a new theory that explains something. You want to develop a new theory that explains several things, several outstanding pro problems. So he had developed a theory that uh, there was a particle called the cosmion. And the cosmions would collect at the center of the sun and cool the sun enough to explain a big problem at the time, which is why there weren't enough neutrinos coming from the sun. And this cosmion particle was just the right mass to explain dark matter. And so that was a twofer. And that's really, really pretty good. Um, turned out that uh, the solar neutrino problem was solved in another way. But uh, the cosmion was recycled as the weakly interacting massive particle, or, or WIMP. But at this conference, uh, he said, you could find this particle in a double beta decay experiment. And my advisor, Felix, turned to me and said, oh, well, you have a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and I was writing my thesis at the time. I was going to get out. And, and suddenly I had to jail. But you must it was. Out. I was in a hole in the ground. <laughs> so yeah, you must literally. have been involved with the first xenon experiment then. No, no, Felix no. Bone. Th th this was before the oh, first before. Zealand experiment. I was building the first Zealand experiment. Of course. Uh, so you, why do you have to be in a hole in the ground? And I know you mean that literally. Literally, uh, I was yeah. in the in the San Gotthard tunnel, <laughs> which is a road tunnel between Germany, uh, Switzerland, and, and Italy, for bringing Ferraris to Germany. Um, and uh, we were, we were just there because it's underneath uh, one of the Alps, and mm -hmm. and that provides. Uh, uh, shielding from cosmic rays, which is is just this boring s charged particles that interact with light that just kind of come raining down and screw everything up. So any serious dark matter experiment has to be way, way, way underground. And uh, I want to give a lot of credit to Elena here because she spent a lot of time underground. underground. And it's horrible. I mean, you know, it's... it's but it's a beautiful he place. Hell is not underground for no reason. I'll, I'll <laughs> tell you that. And I've been some pretty bad places underground. So um, it was also a bad experience because, so the idea is that because 
billions of dark matter particles pass through us without interacting at all, which is why they're dark, which is why we don't see them, because yeah. they don't interact with our eyes, they don't interact with light, they don't interact with our bodies. So you have to go deep underground with the hope that you'll kind of filter, yeah. so that like every once in a blue moon, one dark matter particle will just weakly interact with yeah, something you in don't the have cave. To go, you don't have to go with yourself for Peter underground. Mm -hmm. I mean, your eyes, your body, because we need something also very appropriate for these mm -hmm. uh, famous whims to right. scatter off. Mm -hmm. So we need to find some appropriate detector material, as we say. So I think the, we're, we're going to get to your experiment yeah. in a second, which I'm excited to show people, but I think your experiment was also depressing because you didn't detect anything. Well, it, it's not the only it, one. It, <laughs> it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't totally depressing. Uh, we showed that, uh, and this was important at the time, we showed that, that the dark matter particle could not be a super duper heavy neutrino. Mm -hmm. And that, that yeah. was, that was uh, a, a big deal at the moment. But I also learned something you know, really important, which I think Elena learned before I did. But uh, one reason my experiment was, was crappy for looking for dark matter is that we only measured energy one way. Uh, and uh, that meant that our experiment was susceptible to other kinds of particles. And what I came out of that experiment realizing is that if you wanted to do this right, you had to measure the energy at least two different ways. Mm -hmm. and mm. I'll let you. Yeah, take but it before from there. that, actually, you mentioned neutrinos, right? Yeah. And Can you tell us why and neutrinos I, I, are dark? I guess we should give the message that we have seen this dark matter. Sorry. I, but we have, because we know of dark matter, at least we know of one form of dark matter, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. That's the neutrinos, because the neutrinos, I mean, we know that neutrinos make about less than a percent, maybe 0.5 percent of the total energy density of this universe. When we do this pie chart and we look at the universe energy mass density and we say only 5 percent, less than 5 percent is made of stuff that we know of, of this 5%, actually, or those 5%, we also include this tiny amount, which is less than half a percent, yeah. is so the neutrinos. Seen. And they have very good, the neutrinos at least, have very good characteristics to be a good whim. They are a real example of a dark matter particle. They yeah, are it is. Whim, That's why in sure. my mind I yeah. say we have seen a tiny, yes. tiny, tiny amount of dark matter right. so to in clarify, neutrinos. Is that yeah, correct? I for mean, sure. Wimps yes. exist, yeah. as you're saying. We know that there are wimps, weakly interacting massive particles yeah. in the form of neutrinos, and, um, and they're dark. So why isn't that the dark matter? Why aren't we done? Because the whatever is there that we know about neutrinos, at least the standard neutrino, let's not go into sterile guys, but what see more about. male insecurity because there are neutrinos <laughs> that are sterile. I swear that's a technical yeah. the term. The normal ones, are the standard neutrino are, species, mm -hmm. are not enough to make the dark matter that we know is there, right? I read, what a, are these I read a job. We know, from, we know from the early universe that there's not enough of them. There's not enough of them. I, I read a, this is an aside, but I, I, I read a job application uh, <laughs> that, that referred to the candidate as making seminal contribution to the field of sterile neutrinos. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty, and it was, I think, totally innocently written. I'm sure most, I'm sure it's all completely innocent, but you know, it's like Freudian. Okay, let's not digress but on anyway, the psychology I, I, of <laughs> I wanted to get to the point that he made that, well, okay, so we, we're actually going quite off the board here. I like yeah, this to is, keep it. Don't you guys come here so that we go off the board? I yeah, mean, but I mean, we talk they about us to be on the board. then he comes the wimp, we yeah, don't tell him what this wimps, why, okay, why do we like this wimp? So we forgot to say that, right? Please I mean, do. I guess one of the main reasons we keep talking about WIMPs and later on we'll talk about something else. First of all, we have no clue about what this dark matter is. So, But that remains the statement is very strong. But this WIMP idea is there and is still very cherished today, still today, because there is... There, is, there are other problems in physics that we have faced and there are so-called we say technically extension of this. We have a nice model of particle physics, the way we think all matter that we have seen and studied and known can be described. It's a beautiful model that we call the standard model, but it has some 
shaky things. There are things we don't understand, and so we, are, we have advo advocated that we need to find ways to solve this problem, and some of these ways that we have advocated are new theories that we call theories beyond the standard model of particle physics, and one of them is the so-called supersymmetry. You probably heard it or you read reading the New York Times. So Susie, right? So, and we have an accelerator out there across the Atlantic here in Geneva, for which we spend billions and billions of dollars, I guess billions, I don't know, to, to be the most powerful machine we ever built to reproduce more or less this, this state of temperature and density that the universe had at the early on, right? So we hope now with these big machines there in Geneva, the, L the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, to actually by smashing protons with the highest energies and whatever that we ever managed to do, we hope to actually create the same situation, the same condition as right after the Big Bang. And in doing that, we hope to create these so-called particles, which we believe can make the dark matter, the so-called WIMPs. So the WIMP miracle is there because there are models such as the supersymmetry, which actually predicts a particle which has all the right things as the WIMP, right? Yeah, so, so we hope to produce it at, in Geneva, and at the same time, we hope to see it in other ways that we can talk about, including my way. Um, yeah, so we're gonna um, discuss ways of looking for it besides the Large Hadron Collider, but just to remind people about the whole hoopla over the discovery of the Higgs, this ah, is yeah. the same machine the that same discovered machine. the Higgs particle, also known as the God particle, originally known as the Goddamn particle, um, by Leon Letterman, yeah. right, and his publisher said, you know, maybe we shouldn't call your book the Goddamn particle. Like, let's call it the God particle. And so Leon said, we managed to offend uh, two groups, those who believe in God and those who don't. <laughs> we were warmly received by those in the middle, I think was good. Um, so it's the same machine, yes. It's I the same machine, say, and the, the real the hope now, for sure, is yeah. to create dark matter. Um, can we talk about this image for a second? Do, uh. Do you know this, Peter? You must know this image, the bullet cluster. Oh, yeah. Um, so the bullet cluster is uh, an example where a small cluster of galaxies crashes into another cluster. Do you want to talk about the bullet cluster? Uh, yeah, so uh, this is actually three different pictures uh, yeah. is, uh, superimposed. Uh, but there is, uh, if you look at the white things, uh, that's a collection of galaxies going that way. And, and this is a collection of galaxies going that way, uh, as evidenced by the, the galaxies that you actually see. And um, by looking at, at X-rays, which come from uh, normal matter, neutrons, protons, all that stuff, hitting other normal matter, uh, which composes the gas in between the galaxies, you can map out where that, that gas is. And that's shown here in pink, and it's passing through each other and dragging because when they hit, they, they slow down. Elena talked about the, the lensing effect and how you can map dark matter by, by looking at the lensing of all these surrounding galaxies, and that's shown here in blue. And that maps out where the dark matter is. So you can just think of the blue as where the dark matter is, the pink is where a lot of the normal matter is, and what you've seen is in this collision, the dark matter hasn't interacted at all and has run ahead of the normal matter, which has had to drag through the normal matter from the other, from the other galaxies. So this is an amazing picture. It, it, it's a little bit deceptive, and it, it simplifies an enormous uh, amount of, of uh, observations and data analysis and a fair number of assumptions, which are well justified. But it, it, it really shows that dark matter does not interact with normal matter very much. And uh, that's evidenced by the fact that, that this, is, this dark matter is really separated from, from the normal matter.
And so. And it's also a cool name. Whoever thought of bullet plaster, <laughs> that just. That's a good one. That's certainly a guy. So this is pretty recent, this image. I mean, it's not less, decades. Less than 10 years. Less, yeah. So less than 10 years. So 10 years ago, people were still bitterly skeptical, debating, skeptical. very skeptical that maybe there wasn't such a thing as dark matter, maybe we're just wrong about the theory of gravity or something else. And this image, I think, was really the one. Yeah, so it's easy. Zwicky, mm -hmm. rotation curves, this. Even gravitational lensing was Le not. Yeah, le lensing is kind of more diffuse, yeah. I think. But, mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of just the boom, boom, boom is. Yeah, because even, right, even things, so here's an example of a, of a lensed image where they've color-coded in blue the dark matter, um, which was lensing distant galaxies, distorting the images of distant galaxies. And this is this mysterious ring of dark matter that's, I think, millions of light years across and, um, and is uh, a, another example of lensing and one of the weird features. Um, we've talked a little bit about WIMPs, but now I want to, um, uh, first time, before we ask Elena about, about hers, um, this is a movie about the xenon. Sorry, <laughs> having trouble seeing from the back of your head. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so, okay. Peter, the, what did you build other experiments just after this failed experiment? Well, it, it, it worked. And I got my thesis. <laughs> okay, it worked, it worked in that it put limits. I don't yeah. mean to say failed. That was yeah. too harsh. Yeah. It was a successful experiment in that it put limits on right. the existence of dark matter. But you were not deterred, and you went again and looked for more. No, I was totally deterred. <laughs> and I, I went and worked on something else completely different for 10 years. I was totally disheartened. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I did learn about measuring something two different ways. And I just, I'll, I'll advertise for, for Elena and, and, and set things up for mm -hmm. my later discontent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Th this was 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we measured, we didn't see dark matter with a certain sensitivity. In the intervening time, the sensitivity, your experiment, mm -hmm. is, is a factor of 10 billion times better. So, you know, it, it, was, it was good that I stopped for a while. Let, <laughs> so this you know, is a good let, advertisement. Let the pros <laughs> take over. So, Elena, you want to tell us about your experiment then, which is uh, now underway. So Where that's is the this? entrance. Oh, my God, we have to go fast. There was big doors <laughs> to open. So we are underground, under maybe 1,500 meter of rocks in the center of Italy, under the Gran Sasso Mountains. And here in this short movie, we are showing the making of this new experiment that we just built and which started a few months ago. So that's the making of this uh, so-called water tank, which we fill with 700 cubic meters of pure water, because even if we are under these mountains to shield ourselves from the cosmic rays, these suckers still make it to come down there, and we still have to do something. So we shield these detectors with water. It's a very relatively cheap material. So we, you always see these huge water containers uh, in which detectors are placed if you go into these underground experiments. This is actually the top looking, uh, <laughs> and it's very fast. Hey, so. is it going faster than usual? Huh? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. It seems faster than usual. It's, <laughs> it, well, it's supposed to be fast because we, so that's the entrance to this so-called water tank. And that's uh, August, about two years ago, when we finally bring the cryostat, which contains this liquid zine, and I'm going to tell you about. And I'm extremely worried about, we just barely made it through the door, two by two meter door of this tank, to enter this thing, which we are going to use to search for dark matter. And so that's the cryogenic pipes. We, we liquefy this gas, which is the xenon gas, and we make it cold. <coughs> because it's an, a good, good material to detect dark matter. So this is how this pot of liquid xenon looks like. It's just, uh, and this is another picture of something else that we need. This sphere is not just a beautiful thing, it's just a special bottle that we use to contain this precious liquid xenon that we use to detect dark matter. She's really challenging me by showing this short movie because you I didn't me, prepare it to You sent it so me this fast. movie. He, I know. You said show this movie. Elena well, said show okay, this movie. That's, uh, that's she my She said, could you please show this movie? <laughs> it's everything in there. So that's the detector, that's the cryostat. 
This is water. We wrap the baby with a lot of blankets because it's very cold inside. Anyway, minus 100 degrees C or so. So it has everything. That's we close it then and we keep it cold with vacuum and this blanket of Milo's. We use special refrigerator. This is one of my guys. I'm very proud. The cryogenic system built at Columbia University shipped over there to make this gas zinc and cold and to keep it clean we use a lot of stuff which you just see in these pictures we have to keep it clean we have to keep it cold uh, a lot of technologies we have to remove tiny traces of krypton which is another gas which we have in the atmosphere that, that guy wasn't that wearing guy a harness. Superman is he one wasn't wearing a harness he was not wearing the harness but are he's are a you, very tall guy you're lock the experiment down <laughs> yeah Stop and these, work order. these guys are putting mylar foil around inside the, the inner surface of this water tank, as we call it, this stainless steel container. So that we put mylar to reflect light because that tank is not just passive water. We put, I, I, uh, we put photosensors, stuff, detectors that we need to detect lights. We are looking for the sharing of light from muons which come through the mountains and heat us underground. A lot of electronics, computers, of course, these experiments don't just... Every time I ask, I'm asked the question, but do you see when the WIMP interacts in your liquid xenon detector? I, I answer, I wish I could. No, we have to do a lot, of, a lot of analysis, a lot of processing of this data to pull out this very rare event, event from the millions, billions of events that we have. And this is the moment where we put the actual detector together the detector itself is a beautiful piece of art in my mind. Everything we build is a piece of art. So it uses special photosensors, photomultipliers, which are able to work at this low temperature to sustain some pressure. It's a time projection chamber. I don't know that I can say it in such a few moments. This is the critical moment where we have wrapped our thing assemble it and we move it from above ground to the tunnel, which you saw at the very beginning of the movie, which I was really very, very scared of, even this short trip by truck to move this very sensitive thing. You spend years to build and then truck can go off roads. But anyway, we were lucky. We bring it underground, we mount it inside this vessel and we have a detector, the most sensitive detector right now to hopefully discover what these WIMPs are made, I mean, what this dark matter is or what are the properties of WIMPs. How That's what the movie is it's, about. It's full? It's, it's filled full with of 3,300 kilograms of xenon, which is a lot of stuff because you pay about $1,000 yeah. per kilogram and you don't find it on the shelves of the damn supermarket, right? <laughs> and, you, and actually it's a very pure one actually kilos of stuff because we have to spend a lot of time to actually keep it clean and also to make it radio pure, I mean, free from krypton and How other How many stuff. years did this experiment take, this particular one to build? Uh, just following my pace, everything has to be very fast for me, so it's mm -hmm. only three years. And we started in 2012 to design it, and mm -hmm. so it's starting to take data now. So why, when you look at these, Peter, these direct detection experiments, so we know dark matter is out there because we look at astronomy, we look at the universe, we see, we see indirect evidence of it, no question. So why the direct detection, the actually capturing the particle in these experiments, why are you um, so skeptical about that now? Well, I'm, I'm not skeptical. It's just not. It's called I'm, scientific controversies, Peter. <laughs> He's not. I'm, I'm getting there. I I'm didn't know there. he was skeptical. I'm ready to. I'm ready for the controversy. Tell me. <laughs> I am spending every minute of my day and every day and night to make this damn thing to work. You better but, not skeptical. <laughs> I mean, that, that's I, mean why I'm not I, doing I really it. love my, I mean, we did the best we could. And this is one way, I agree, it's one way to look for this yeah. mystery. And we all agree that this might be the wrong way, but if you don't find, if you don't do it, and you don't Absolutely. find out, I mean, how do we say? I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I did it for 30 years, I'm done, you know. <laughs>
Um, no, I was, uh, I'd felt this way for a, for, for a while. I, sp I spent a lot of time trying to look for new ways uh, to look for, for dark matter, in particular, relate it with the Earth's motion through the cosmos, which I think would be very powerful. But uh, at, at, a, at a certain point, uh, and I am in my mid-50s, I, I, I came to realize that, it, that uh, I, I was really just too frustrated uh, with this to continue. And then at the same time, uh, the LIGO experiment uh, mm -hmm. detected black holes. And uh, my colleague Paul Schechter and I started talking about very small black holes, could they be dark matter? This was originally Hawking's idea in 1972, and he did some actually not very good calculation of how many little tiny black holes would get made in the uni early universe, and concluded that there were too many, and so he had to figure out a way to get rid of him, get rid of them, and that's where he wrote his famous paper about Hawking radiation, which is actually that black holes emit light and eventually evaporate. Uh, and so he was very happy to have, have gotten rid of these black holes. But uh, it's still theoretically possible that, that they could be uh, dark matter. And uh, the LIGO experiment detected very, very large black holes, probably not dark matter. But that just made me start thinking, why not primordial black holes? I actually have a, a beautiful, um, well, this is, this is yeah. a black hole That's lensing light. Um, this is a cartoon. We can't see anything like this with a telescope. This is, this is not real. Um, but this is, uh, Peter, maybe you want to talk about this computer simulation of the LIGO collision? Oh, yeah, well. So this yeah. is a numerical simulation of what we would see were we incredibly hazardously, deathly close to the two black holes that collided. Um, uh, do you want to tell people about okay, what the LIGO discovery was? Sure. Uh, uh, I don't know what I did. Okay. James is going to yell at me. Thank you, James, our AV guy, uh -huh. <laughs> who's the so best. Just, okay, thank you. <laughs> even before they start moving, yeah. uh, this, this, there's some really like interesting things in this, this <laughs> picture. Yeah. If, you, if you look out here, this is a, a, a star field. Uh, this region of space, if, if these black holes weren't there, would look like this. Just kind of a uniformly random distribution uh, of stars. And, and the reason you're seeing, you know, the, the, these, these weird curved structures is that these black holes are, are acting like crappy lenses and really distorting the image. And so as you see them orbit each other, and it's thought that a lot of black holes do occur in, in pairs because a lot of stars occur in pairs and stars, some stars eventually turn into black holes. So a binary system, binary two, uh, is, is what you expect. So if you start it again, so you can see the lens moves around and so those stars aren't jumping around, it's, it's just the, the lenses. And, as they're moving, they're losing energy through gravitational radiation. So actually by bending space-time, they're, they're losing energy and moving closer and, and closer together. Um, one of these black holes is about 28 solar masses. The other was about 30-something. And they merge into one stationary black hole. And then... You can watch it again for fun. <laughs> what, what you can see as they merge is they have to turn into a sphere. Mm. And as they do, it jiggles a little bit. That's called the ring down. And that was the thing that, that LIGO saw that really convinced them that it was actually um, a black hole merger, uh, was, was this little bit of jiggle at the end. So watch, they're, they're together. Do you see how it just... And then you can see this is still gravitational radiation coming out. So that, that to me was, you know, that's really much more substantial evidence that black holes even exist than we had before. There Absolutely. was a lot of pretty compelling indirect evidence. But and for people who don't know, that discovery was just made a year ago. It yeah. was in September 2015 and it wasn't announced until February, February 
February 11th, 2016. The date is indelible. It's in all our minds. It's a good day. It was a good day. It's a good day. That experiment took 50 years, 50 arduous, difficult years yeah. with a lot of skeptics thinking yeah. that they would not succeed. And I, you know, I'm sure the dark matter experimentalists are it's hoping about the same for the same. Time. Yeah. Right. Or <laughs> have had, I mean, dark matter experiments began decades ago, the yeah. first ones. And, um, 88. And, and we're still, haven't succeeded, but maybe like LIGO, they will succeed. But I want to hear your idea about primordial black holes. So you're saying they're not a fundamental particle of matter, dark no. matter particles. Maybe there's something else. So, so b before matter gets made in, in, in the Big Bang, there is a, a period where the universe expands very, very fast called inflation. And there are good theoretical reasons to believe in this. Uh, but during that time, quantum mechanics causes space-time to jump around a lot, and it is possible, and this is what Haw Hawking calculated, that you can get enough energy in one place so that you form a small black hole, a black hole with about the mass of, say, the moon, and uh, that black hole would have a, a radius a little bit bigger than a proton. And that works really well. I mean, just imagine that. I mean, how big is a proton? Uh, how big <laughs> no is a proton? It's, it's very, like very, small. Yeah. very small. So, but it's the mass of the moon. The mass That's of the pretty moon, spectacular. Yeah. And, and the amazing thing is, one of these could go zipping through the Earth, and you probably wouldn't really know it. Um, it'd scoop up a few kilograms Ow. of matter as it went by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so it it'd be really hard to find. Uh, so the same idea, the black holes would be flying through us right now, mm -hmm. but uh, not lingering long enough to um, suck everything in and, and you know, eat up the earth, and um, so, they would just do a flyby. So for the, the wimps Elena looks for, I, uh, it, 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 it's, it's about one per liter or quart, depending on which side of the Atlantic. Uh, the black holes are, are so much heavier, it would be, um, you know, a few, uh, you, you know, per few kilom cu cubic kilometers. So they wouldn't hit you as much. <laughs> uh, so, and, and also they're so small that since they would be aware that most of our bodies are empty space, yeah. they would presumably not collide that often mm. with no, other they, nuclei. They, they, they'd scoop up a little bit of mass. A little bit of mass. Get a little hole in you. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> so is that like an experiment we could do? Like how many random holes, holes do people in your body? mysteriously develop? Well, no, but there is... While walking uh, through uh, Red Hook? Th th there is another <laughs> thing. Uh, I, I read a, a pace paper recently, and this is legit, okay? I checked this guy out. Dan Markavich uh, wrote a paper uh, considering the possibility, suppose there was one of these black holes at the center of our sun. So it would sit there in the center of the sun, and it would start sucking in the matter of the sun, and after a few million years, it would suck the whole sun, and it'd just be gone. But the really interesting thing about this paper is the way the sun works, you wouldn't see any effect of this until about 20 minutes before the sun goes out. <laughs> So, you know, you'd be walking around. You can, you can do something in those 20 minutes. Well, you know, it, it'd get really bright and then it'd get dark. And so I, 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 got this, I got this really interesting idea. Do stars ever just disappear for no reason? And, and, uh, the opposite of a supernova. Because exactly. Just, and there was a famous out. experiment called Macho that, that mm. looked for stars that got brighter and dimmer. Uh, but they never looked for ones that just disappeared. So I have their data, and I have a student, Brody Elwood. Uh, he's a sophomore, and he's going through all the data, looking to see if there was ever, if any stars just disappeared. So we have five years, two images per night of 50 million stars. So this leads me, we're very close <laughs> to the Q&A time, so, but this leads me to ask um, if they are primordial, if, if dark matter really is primordial black holes, these very tiny but very heavy um, basically particles, black holes act like particles at that level, they do evaporate through Hawking's famous process. So what does that mean for the future of our universe if all these dark matter uh, objects, let's not call them particles, evaporate away? Well, they, they don't, it would be a long time before they yeah, evaporated. It's a long time. For, for moon mass. But humor now, me. 
How, <laughs> it's a very long time, right? So the the point is that smaller the particle, well, the faster I mean, it evaporates. If, if, yeah. So if if suppose they were, I'm going to use some science talk. Uh, Ten to the twenty six grams is about the mass of the moon. So ten with twenty six one with twenty six zeros. Mm -hmm. If they're ten to the fifteen grams, that's when they evaporate in the age of the universe. So if, if they were that light, and and they all evaporated today. Um, you know, the galaxy would basically just kind of fly apart, and the clusters of galaxies would just fly apart, and we'd be um, in pretty short order, you know, a few hundred million years, just this lonely little solar system uh, around this kind of crummy sun. Right, so <laughs> if, um, if our species were to lose all record of civilization and maybe start again in a billion years, um, new species emerges that observes the universe, they would not necessarily see galaxies anymore. No. It no, would they just be a bunch of that. solar systems sort of diffusely wandering through space time. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because we, I mean, we, the, 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 our solar system will just lose its planets mm -hmm. in about four billion years, I think, just, just from chaotic motion. Mm -hmm. So you might not even have that. Yeah. And then eventually the sun goes dead. Yeah, our voices are trailing off. Did you notice? Like, and well, then, a, and then we merge with Andromeda. That hmm. also happens. But so, um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. There's a great paper you were the saying. Freeman Dyson wrote a great uh -huh. paper about uh, the end of the universe um, and how how you can circumvent it. He had, he had a strategy for how to avoid the end of the universe. Uh, well, so it's called time without end. Uh, it reminds me of this Woody Allen quote, you know, forever is a very long time, especially the bit towards the end. Yeah. You know yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you, if, like you, if you hibernate in just the right way, you will think you live forever. <laughs> and and okay, Freeman Dyson's a real guy. This is getting very depressing. <laughs> no, so it's I think okay. that's why I like the way. So celebrate the Sorry. moment. <laughs> celebrate the moment. Celebrate the moment. Absolutely. You know? So, um, Elena, what if dark matter is made of particles? I mean, do you have this anxiety that your experiments may never succeed? Every is that night. something you worry about? <laughs> <laughs> and Every it's not day. that they won't succeed. No, I mean, for sure. To actually, actually, maybe to be honest, mm -hmm. we have to admit that mm -hmm. not, not only we don't know, but most likely this dark matter comes in all these forms. There might be wings, there might be primordial black holes, and maybe some all planets, <laughs> all of it, right? We have no idea. But I guess the only positive thing I can think of is that the only thing which we can do is just to keep looking for what this identi its identity is, right? So LIGO is a great tool that we have, and so is my experiment and many other efforts, the LHC. So I guess the positive thing for us is that as curious human beings, we just have to keep searching and finding out what this damn thing is, because, <laughs> I mean, how can we just sit here and say that we just make the very tiny bit of this beautiful thing that we show. I mean, it's actually quite depressing, but at the same time, we feel very powerful that we are curious, right? There, I mean, I, I want to amplify on that. No, because I mean, the, I, 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 you know, I, I, mean, I, I... I'm not depressed yet. No, I'm you not. shouldn't be, because, you, you know, when, when, when you're a scientist, there's, uh, there's kind of an obsessive yeah. nature to the whole thing that, that it's like you can't not do it. And then if you do something and mix, and this is the problem with you and me. I mean, maybe I, I still find a lot of fun in doing these experiments because yeah. every, every day, every moment, every year, we learn how to make it better. And so for me, it's all about improving. I mean, I'm never happy. That's the problem. That's <laughs> you, you so you I'm always can make something better. You can make yourself better. You, you, know you can I'm make your detector better. Yeah. So we have fun in doing it. But I agree that if I were to choose today, at this stage, after more or less 15 years of, of going after this stuff, these whims, with this technology, and I had to decide I am going to build something which takes another 10, 15 years of my life, Probably I would be more cautious, I have to say that. But we are rolling, we have the best technology, at least so far that I can uh, think of. So, and we have fun doing it. We train a lot of young minds, a lot of students, and 
young scientists. So we have fun doing it, and that's part of it, right? How can you yeah, like the, your the, job the, if you don't have the fun? The students are a big part, you know, because yeah. they're, you know, you get older, but your students are always the same age. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I see that I get old when they come, and they come with their kids, yeah. and the kids grow up, and they come to your lab as well, the bottom, undergraduates. The so. bottom line is either the xenon experiment that you founded will be like LIGO, and will well, make the first direct detection of this form of matter we have never seen before. Let's hope so. Or, <laughs> or it's or like Fitzcarraldo, else. you know, we, we do these crazy experiments, but, but, but in every moment we're making discoveries about the universe either way. Well, and we're, and, and we're doing things that are like really important. I mean, one of my favorite things to do is glue something to something else. I mean, it's, it's, glue is such an amazing You stop. see why cra physicists are yeah. crazy. So and, on and that, that note, and you wonder why theorists make fun of experimentalists. <laughs> <laughs> but on, on that note, I want to... I want to put glue too. <laughs> We're not done with the night, but I want to thank Sorry. our guests and open it up for a Q&A. So okay, can we, okay. we thank our guests for a moment?